If not, we'll wait for the discussion period. And our next speaker is uh, Dr. Robert Califf, who is the Vice Chancellor for Clinical and Translational Research uh, and the Director of the Duke Translational Medical Institute. Um, He's also editor-in-chief of the American Heart Journal. And, and before Dr. Kayla starts, I just wanted to say, I mean, he, he has been one of the true champions of the sort of collaborative uh, research and sharing out there in the world. And we're, we're very honored to have him. Dr. Caleb? Great. Thanks. It's a real uh, thrill and honor to be here today. I think this is an important event in the history of uh, human experimentation. And I hope that a lot of uh, good will come from it um, downstream. I'm also sort of... Um, pet up here in this talk because I was told I could only say positive things about the benefits. Um, both of my sons are engineers and I've learned the reason for that is that um, we're, I'm attracted to problems, not to things that are going well. And engineers tend to think about it, everything as a problem that needs to be solved and that's kind of the way I look at it. So, But I'm going to talk about the positive and it's a bit of a personal journey so I hope you'll uh, bear with me. Um, uh, so the, the premise of all this, which um, I think has really been nicely reviewed by Elizabeth, is at least from my view, uh, trial participants give consent to be involved in a human experiment. I actually like to call it that because that's really what it is. The basis that enables ethics committees to approve this experiment is that there's a commitment to create generalizable knowledge. And so if, in a baseball analogy, I would say if the commitment is to create generalizable knowledge, a single is publishing the results. Unfortunately, even NIH-funded research, as Dr. Krumholtz pointed out recently in a review of clinicaltrials.gov, a very high percentage doesn't even get to first base. Uh, getting, hitting a double would be at least sharing summary data. Hitting a triple would be confidentially sharing detailed clinical data. Um, and then there's a question out there lingering, uh, very much raised by Elizabeth, would a home run be publicly sharing detailed clinical data. And if that were true, why would it be the case? At least in my experience, there are three really big reasons to share data across clinical trials. First is that trials often get results that seem conflicting. And um, you know, one of the sentinel moments for me was when the CEO of Pfizer in the middle of the Vioxx controversy came on the Ted Koppel show and said, you know, um, you don't really need to worry about this out there in the public because your doctor will know what to do. If you think doctors can interpret conflicting clinical trial data based on looking at the data abstractly without any kind of expert synthesis of information, I think you're sadly mistaken. Um, so um, demonstration or replication is a critical element of all of science, and I think it's equally true in human experimentation. But when the results truly do differ, um, it can either be chance or real, and only by multiple replications can you sort that out. Benefit-risk balance of treatment may vary as a function of patient characteristics, and in fact, we, we know that's the case. But knowing when it's true and when it's only a random play of chance really requ requires looking across clinical trials rather than simply within a single study. And it's uh, increasingly a global issue that cost-effectiveness is subject to the same issues. And as we look at new therapies like the new anticoagulants that we've just been working with, two of the big new ones, one on the market, one about to get there, um, entire countries are looking at it saying individually this is effective treatment compared to warfarin, but can we afford it as a country? And if you can't afford it as a country, um, you got to make decisions based on the degree of benefit relative to risk and the cost involved. So it all seems so simple when I started out because um, I was a coronary care unit doctor. When I started out, we prayed, we put people in bed for a couple of weeks, so we gave a little Lasix and morphine, and the mortality rate was well over 20%, more than one in five. Along came uh, the revolutionary knowledge that um, blood clots cause heart attacks and that we could open up these uh, blood clots. And then a whole host of clinical trials ensued that I think um, set a paradigm, which to this day I still don't understand why it hasn't been followed by other fields. And the paradigm is pretty simple um, in concept. You develop scientific ideas. You do the right clinical trials. If the right clinical trials are definitive, particularly multiple clinical trials uh, replicated, then it becomes knowledge, and the knowledge can be applied in practice and measured in practice through registries. At the middle of all this is measurement and education, which at its core is dependent on liberated data. At its core, it's dependent 
on many people being able to look at the data and draw the best conclusions. And so the way it happened, um, a lot of trials were done, not shown on here, the 90% of ideas that didn't work, that were weeded out because of the high requirement for data based on clinical outcomes. But those that did work required tens of thousands of people, not hundreds, um, to be really definitive so this could become a standard. And only a few made it through this, um, this uh, high hurdle. But when they did, and we could measure whether the uptake was occurring, what we found was that when you've done it right and you've got definitive evidence and you apply the evidence in practice, there's a direct relationship to lowering the risk of being dead. Now, I'm not trying to suck up to Harlan here, but it made my day when his group published a study that showed the end result of all this was that your risk of being dead if you roll into a hospital in North America with your heart attack now is 40% lower than it was when we started. And I would argue this was not a matter of going from biology to marketing. This is a matter of a series of steps that were carefully planned and thought about by really smart people. Um, not me, uh, mostly the people at Oxford and other people around the world. You invent and develop a technology, you do your trial, you add your data to the cumulative database, you generate new hypotheses, you do more trials, and you continue to refine. And that's really the way it worked in this field uh, on a global scale. And to this day, as I say, I still don't understand why every field doesn't do it this way. So here's, here's the end result of it. It started with the uh, antithrombotic trials collaboration, individual patient data. 135,000 people up to 1997. This is ancient by today's standards, um, but still very important. And co it was compelling when all the data were looked at that giving an aspirin was a beneficial thing to do. We then moved on to opening arteries for fibrinolytic therapy. And here there's another lesson to be learned. The data were um, entirely consistent across subgroups except for two. And you'll notice there the group with SD segment depression on the electrocardiogram the uh, risk-benefit calculation went the wrong direction, not statistically significantly the wrong direction, and people who came in late to the hospital beyond 12 hours, um, really not much of a benefit seen there. And the beauty of this is that multiple clinical trials showed the same thing. This enabled us, uh, and we were privileged to be the coordinating center for the first HRQ clinical pra practice guidelines, it enable us to take a simple measure and tell doctors, look, do an electrocardiogram as quickly as you can. It's an emergency, and if there's ST elevation, uh, you better open the artery. If there's not ST elevation, it's a different scenario. And this led to a whole different set of trials in the non-ST elevation population. This was a result of combining data from multiple trials at the individual patient level to show that the absence of benefit in fibrinolytic therapy was reproducible in multiple clinical trials in that subgroup of the population. Not an isolated finding, but reproducible. But it was also the case of benefit diminished with time, and this was shown, look at the numbers of patients here at different time intervals after arriving at the hospitals, and you see you begin to approach uh, the level of no benefit. Well, we then moved on to percutaneous intervention, and uh, people like me said, this is ridiculous. It's a technology that's so expensive it could never replace the simplicity of giving uh, a fibrinolytic drug. And it was hard to do the trials because you had to have a center that was capable technologically of doing the trial. It led to smaller trials being done, and it was really the replication across many trials that led to the definitive conclusion that um, on average, in most situations, if you have an ST elevation MI with a risk of dying of 10 to 25 percent, within the next 24 to 72 hours, you want to get to a center that can do direct percutaneous intervention and open the artery definitively. It's better than fibrinolytic therapy. Many of us grudgingly accepted that knowledge, and it was really the replication across multiple trials that enabled that to happen. So this was the story of ST elevation, dramatic reduction in mortality. The key steps I've been through, it had to do not only with the inventions, it had to do with doing multiple trials, combining the data as a normal course. We didn't even really think there was much of a question. It was just what you did because of the way the Oxford people started it. And then you invent more therapies and do new trials. So one of the conclusions I came to, to this with as I was thinking about it is, you know, this valley of death we're all talking about, there's a good reason that it's there. Uh, this path from biology to marketing um, is full of hazards, it's full of monsters that um, trip you up 
because most of what we invent doesn't actually work or it has detrimental consequences that we didn't uh, that we didn't predict. And so um, my argument is that uh, we shouldn't try to do away with the valley of death. What we need are really useful, intelligent guides to get across the valley of death, doing the right things as opposing to, to uh, shortcut the right things. And I believe in the long run, uh, trying to replicate the experience of the SD elevation in my global effort in every field by liberating data, making it available, stopping things that don't work more quickly, and reinforcing things that do work through the coordination of uh, globally done uh, multi-site um, clinical trials is the right way to do it. Let's go on to another problem dear to my heart, uh, sudden death. Running a coronary care unit, um, we uh, would see often people who died and got resuscitated. Um, it's a tragic situation. You'd like to prevent it. And what could be uh, more appealing than putting in something that if you have ventricular fibrillation uh, gives you a shock internally? And sure enough, a bunch of clinical trials were done sequentially, and uh, we had the privilege of working a lot with combining the data in this situation. And uh, this just shows the time course of the different clinical trials. You had different circumstances, different enrollment criteria. But for the most part, one of the real beauties of this set of trials was that the baseline data and the outcomes were measured in a fairly consistent manner. And so um, overall, when we looked at the effect of ICDs in the clinical trials that were done, it's about a 30% reduction in the risk that you're going to be dead if you get an ICD compared to not if you met the entry criteria. A consistent result across multiple trials, except you'll notice two there. What was different about those trials? One looked at immediate post-MI patients, and the other looked at immediate post-bypass surgery patients. And so um, when you look at it from the point of view of hazard ratio, you see these two trials really stand out as being different. And I don't have the slides to show it all, but when you do the subgroup analyses and all the other trials and look at these same populations, this is a fairly consistent finding. And it's led to something you'll hear more about this year um, as uh, CMS is enforcing the rule, but it led to a change in reimbursement where ICDs are heavily reinforced with really good reimbursement if you include the patients that are below the line, but in the first 30 days after MI or immediately after bypass surgery, um, you're not going to get paid. And in fact, they're currently, as I understand it, looking back at those who violated the payment rules and may take some money back from a few, few hospitals that violated that rule. But there was another problem that came up that was very controversial where having uh, data from multiple trials made a difference. In the initial trial that showed the benefit made it too. Um, you notice the hazard ratios are similar between men and women, but because there are fewer women, the difference was not statistically significant. Now, most people who are knowledgeable about clinical trial data would say, so what? But there was a robust debate about whether women should get defibrillators since there was not a significant benefit in women. And the second trial, major trial, Scud uh really sealed the deal because it also didn't um, show uh, a, a difference I'm sorry, this is really the, the um, outcome of ICD therapy, but it looked very similar to made it too, and when you combine the two trials, there was a significant difference uh, with women. But then other subgroup characteristics turned out to be fairly consistent among multiple trials. Here's a simple uh, parameter again, the ECG. If you have a narrow QRS interval on the ECG, you'll notice that um, there's a benefit, but it's relatively smaller. If you have um, a very wide QRS interval, there's a big benefit. And this is not a reversal of effect, detriment, and benefit. It's just a gradation in the degree of benefit, which leads to a very interesting argument about cost effectiveness of ICDs with a narrow QRS. And the initial trials only enroll patients with low ejection fraction, but later trials enroll the broader spectrum of patients. And you can see that if you had a really markedly impaired left ventricle, very consistent result, except in the immediate post-MI period, um, of uh, dramatic reduction in mortality. But in the group uh, of over 30 percent, the reduction in mortality is less. And so this has led to a preferential treatment of patients with low ejection fraction, according to the CMS rule. Now, um, what about statins? One of my favorite topics. What could be more consistent? than the effects of statins. But again, here's a case where data were liberated, and I think it's made a huge difference in the ability of people to make a statement 
about the class of drugs. It reduces everything that's bad for you in terms of cardiovascular events, no matter what you look at. But you look at the patient uh, numbers here, they're really quite substantial. But a part of it that's really been a benefit of combining data, um, in, in my view, is to uh, make the case, uh, I think, uh, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that we're not simply talking about lipid lowering as a concept. We're talking about the fact that statins, regardless of where your lipids are, reduce your risk of having adverse cardiovascular events. So if you look at this slide, you'll notice 45,000 patients in each group from combining individual patient data enabling uh, the collaborators to look um, uh, according to the, the specific um, groups of lipid levels. And you'll see in the second grouping there that even if your LDL cholesterol was less than 135, um, uh, a very uh, dramatic uh, benefit there. And this is uh, true at least down to 70, and there are trials uh, going on right now to look even lower than that. Now, what about some um, emergency uses of combining data? I'm going to show you one of my favorite ones. We uh, were in the middle of the Improve It trial looking at a drug called azetamibe in lowering LDL cholesterol. Um, uh, the trial became under a shadow because of a controversy about um, plaque, a plaque regression trial that I think has been greatly misinterpreted but nevertheless um, led to a controversy. We we're in the midst of this very large trial, 18,000 patients being enrolled, azetamibe versus placebo. We were limping along because of the controversy about the plaque regression trial when a trial done entirely uh, for a different reason, looking at aortic stenosis in Scandinavia, when they unblinded the trial, um, they found an excess of cancer in the group randomized to azetamide versus placebo. So here we are in the midst of an 18,000 patient trial. There's another trial that shows an excess of cancer done somewhere else for a different indication. <laughs> And the question is, what do we do um, with our trial? Because the drug was already under scrutiny, many people said, this is it. Um, you got to stop. But because we were working uh, with uh, the group in Oxford who were also doing a trial, um, we were able to, in midstream, without unblinding the principal investigators, with no involvement of the company in handling the data or the analysis, the company was involved in sending the results of the analysis to the regulatory groups around the world, which is their obligation. By the way, the New England Journal completely misunderstood that in an editorial that they put out about it. But the fact is we were able in midstream in ongoing clinical trials, our data monitoring committees and uh, Richard Pito at Oxford were able to put the data together from these ongoing trials and come out with a statement. And this took individual patient data because, remember, one of the key issues in cancer it's a latency period between the um, time that you're enrolled in the trial and the onset of the cancer. We're able to show beyond the shadow of a reasonable doubt that the, when you combine the data from the two big trials ongoing, that the result from the uh, trial in Scandinavia was a fluke. Absolutely not a hint of an excess of cancer and not a hint of an excess of cancer at any site. So um, this shows that when you handle data correctly, um, and when it's handled independently of the companies by coordinating centers who know what they're doing, it's possible on the fly in the course of two weeks to combine data from ongoing trials and produce relevant data for regulators that overturns uh, play of chance findings in single individual trials that are ongoing. So we concluded from this that we should continue our trials and, you know, one day we'll finish the Improvement trial. It's still um, ongoing. Then the last example I want to give um, is one where disregard of liberation of data, disregard of combining data, I think led to terrible adverse consequences for the American public. What can seem more obvious than if you have uh, renal disease and you're anemic, that you should get erythropoietin uh, and get as much erythropoietin as you need to, quote, normalize the hematocrit? It seemed very obvious. And it was so obvious that our single-payer dialysis system made it um, a clinical practice guideline. This was done. Um, uh, brilliantly by uh, dialysis companies and American physicians. They gave a lot of high-dose erythropoietin. Problem was they forgot to do the clinical trials. They skipped from biology to marketing. And what happened was one of our fellows said, why don't we do a trial on people not yet on dialysis, but who may need dialysis soon because they also do worse the more anemic they are. This was a choir trial, which we did. Unfortunately, the trial was stopped in midstream because the group 
randomized to a higher dose of erythropoietin was doing worse, not better. But the trial was poo-pooed by almost everyone because they said it wasn't a well-done trial, it's probably not right. When the fact is, when all the data came in from all the trials being done, um, high dose erythropoietin was bad. And you can see from the way uh, cumul in cumulative meta-analysis, the way it lines up, that this could have been detected much earlier. And it could have been detected much, much, much earlier if the right trials had been done and the data had been combined. And then the very final example um, to show that this can cause perplexing things to happen that you don't understand. Here's beta blockers for heart failure. What could be more obvious? It reduces your risk of death, period. Definitive results with huge treatment effects. But look at all these trials when broken down to U.S. and rest of world. Now, I'm not here to argue that beta blockers don't work in the U.S., but when five out of five trials show <clears throat> that the effect in the U.S. is much less than the rest of the world, you've got to begin to believe there's something going on here, whether it's other treatments, genetics, or what, I don't know. But this is an unsolved mystery from combining data. So in conclusion, I would argue that liberating data across clinical trials is ethically sound, it clarifies findings for policy recommendations. I tried to show you that. It often raises new questions. And when this evidence step is skipped, as it was with high dose erythropoietin, there's a significant hazard to the public health. And one element of this evidence step should be, I believe, the sharing of patient level data across trials. But um, since I'm not allowed to say anything negative, I'll just close with a point. There are a lot of details to work out, which I'm sure will be completely worked out during the course of the next day and a half. Thank you.